I'm ready if you are. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our first Lunch and Learn for 2024. I'm pretty excited about it. Everyone should be muted as you join the webinar. And I'm just asking you to remain on mute until the end of the presentation. Then we can open it up, unmute. You can raise your hand. We'll have a nice discussion. There's also a Q&A function and a chat function at the bottom. Feel free to use that. I'll keep an eye on it. Uh, the session is being recorded, and the link to the recording will be sent out with the slide deck next week to everyone who signed up. So for those of you who at, were at the Nubia Annual Conference in Boston this week, like me, uh, your head is probably exploding with all the innovation going on, especially when it comes to sludge volume reduction technologies. And not only the new technologies, but like innovative combinations of technologies. And that's exactly what you're going to hear about today. The compelling combination of volute presti watering and low temperature drying for biosolids handling and volume reduction, very critical right now for uh, wastewater. Our presenter today is Chris Hubbard. He's with Process Wastewater Technologies, LLC, or PW Tech. And PW Tech has been a great NEBR member and sponsor for many years now. Chris has been in the water and wastewater industry for over 30 years. He started as a process or project engineer, and he's been in regional sales and sales management of water, wastewater, stormwater, flood products for over 20 years now. He has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Farley Uni Dixon University and serves on the boards of many community organizations, including the Northwest, the Northeast Biosolids and Residuals Association, the Narrow River Preservation Association, and most recently, the Sewer Thermal Energy Network, which is a nonprofit helping util utilities that are interested in using the freely available heat and sewage for heating and cooling. In his spare time, he enjoys spending time sailing off the coast of Rhode Island. So with that introduction, Chris, take it away. Well, thank you, Janine, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, as Janine mentioned, we're uh, here today to talk about my presentation freezing up. Nope, there we go. All right. Sludge dewatering and sludge drying made easy. Um, PW Tech offers a combination or standalone technologies of our, our volute press for sludge dewatering. And uh, we like to call it the screw press 2.0 and our, our plate belt driver system. So just a little bit of background on who we are. Uh, PW Tech has been a leading supplier of the volute dewatering technology in North America for coming on 20 years now. Um, about 350 installations, a number of them with multiple units. So about 440 of our presses throughout the US. Um, the the um, manufacturer and supplier of our dryer technology is the Dorset Group. Dorset is a Netherlands-based company founded in 1984 and globally involved in biomass drying equipment. Um, PW Tech and Dorset have entered into partnerships for us to provide, um, we're um, primarily the US municipal biosolids, but we will handle industrial projects as well, but to provide the US biosolids and residual markets the, the Dorset dryer technology, but supported by a US-based company. So all of the engineering and parts and submittals and warranty and service, all of that will be handled by PW Tech here in the US um, out of our office in Baltimore, Maryland. So, so I wanna start with the, de the dewatering section. Um, as I said, we like to call it the screw press 2.0. It's the PW Tech Volute Press. So just to talk about screw presses a little bit and as a background, um, I'm sure most of you or probably all of you know this, so I'll go through it quickly. The concept behind any screw press out there is quite simple. Um, you mix some sludge with a polymer, you put it in one end of a cylinder of some type, you have a, a scroll that runs through that cylinder and either the flights tighten or the shaft widens or some combination thereof. And you give the sludge a good squeeze 
and force the, the filtrate, or as we call it, the pressate out the openings in whatever the drum is that you use, whether it's a perforated plate or a wedge wire or a screen, the, the concept is the same. And then give it a little final back pressure push of some type at the end, and hopefully you have some reasonably dry cake um, coming out the end. And there's a lot of screw presses out there. For anybody that was out at um, WebTech last year, everywhere you turn, there were you know, horizontal ones, vertical ones, inclined ones, wedge wire ones, perforated plate ones, a, a lot of them out there. And they've been well accepted and work quite well in, in biosolids for, for a very long time now. Like any other technology, those screw presses are not without their challenges. Typically, they're going to be larger in footprint and um, probably weight than other dewatering options. Um, most of that is because a significant portion of the openings for filtrate to escape from are going to be clogged at any given time. So the drum needs to be made, um, pick a number, 25, 30% larger in open area to accommodate um, any number of those openings being plugged while you're operating. Yeah, screw presses can also have capture issues, especially for secondary sludges, um, thin, thin biological sludges. And typically, um, screw presses don't scale very well. The, the larger the diameter gets in a screw press, the harder it is for the water that's trapped in the sludge in or near the center to get out and actually get out through those openings. So you'll find you run two screw presses next to each other, one with a smaller diameter and one with a larger diameter. You're probably going to get better cake solids in the smaller screw press. So to make up for that, the larger screw press is going to have to get longer and longer to, to give you dewatering time. So enter the volute press. So in, in the mid nineties, uh, a screw press using the volute technology was, was designed and developed by a company called Amcon in Japan in association with the Japanese sewer authority. And the goal of the whole project was to overcome the size and cost issues associated with traditional screw presses. The first installation here in North America um, came from PW Tech. Or we were um, part of CBS at the time was in 2005 at Portsmouth, Maryland, and that machine is actually still in operation today. And the Blue really has become the most widely used screw press worldwide. There's 45,000 installations in over 80 countries now. And the, the key, the critical difference between the other screw presses out there and the Blue press is the, the design of the drum. So instead of being a fixed uh, wedge wire or perforated drum, the volute drum is a series of fixed and floating rings. I'll get into that in just a second here. And because of the spacing on the rings and the orientation of the equipment, we can thicken and dewater all in the same drum so we can handle feed solids. We can actually handle feed solids as low as a tenth of a percent. Um, economics dictate that usually a quarter of a percent, maybe half a percent, is where the, the, um, the press really starts to make sense. And here, here's a picture. So you can see the, the, the purple rings are the fixed rings held in place by a bar. And the blue rings, the green rings are just spacers. The blue rings are actually the rings that are uh, float. They're actually uh, free and actually ride on the leading edge of the scroll. So as the scroll comes around, and a little bit of luck, this will work. If you look here, you can actually see the, you can almost see the scroll move and push each ring up out of the way so that the filtrate can escape. As importantly as pushing that ring up out of the way for the filtrate to escape, the other end of the ring is actually pulled into the sludge so the sludge flow across that interface is actually a natural cleaning motion so that when the scroll comes around and now pushes that section of the ring out of the way, 
there, there's no clogs or um, obstructions to the filtrate escaping through there. So the blue press can actually um, dewater sludge without uh, wipers or brushes or high pressure water or anything like that used in traditional scoop presses for, for keeping those open areas clean. So as a result, the, the blue press is typically much more compact than other screw presses, usually half the length and diameter, and the non-plugging casing. So as I mentioned, no brushers or wipes or high pressure water. And because of the non-clogging function, we can handle oily and fatty and a lot of industrial sludges. And then, which leads to the last benefit, the, the very flexible operation and very easy to start and stop and control the throughput and control the cake solids makes it really an ideal dryer, uh, ideal dewatering equipment to feed a sludge dryer. And so throughout the US, the volute presses are feeding quite a number of dryers. I would have to go through and count, but definitely a dozen or more, maybe even two dozen at this point. And we've learned a lot about feeding dryers. Which takes us to our, our next offering. So in keeping with the same philosophy that PW Tech has, um, keep it simple, keep it robust, um, keep it um, easy to work on and easy to operate. The, the Dorset Technology Plate Belt Dryer is the offering that we have in the dryer world now. And you can see in this picture, very, it, it is a, a belt dryer, but instead of a cloth belt or a mesh belt, we are a series of um, either stainless steel or in this picture, um, painted carbon steel plates. And it's almost like an escalator. So the, the, the belts actually travel on a chain track. And when they, as they, before they come around the return, they actually kick up on end and the sludge actually drops down onto the bottom pass of the same belt. So each belt pass in the system, back to slide here, we actually get two passes of sludge or of cake coming along the belt here. You have that flipping mechanism right in behind here, drops right onto the, the same belt and goes back the other way. So we get two passes per belt. So it allows for a, a very compact footprint. And also by using the perforated plate, there's a lot of open area, which results in very, very low pressure drop across the plate and resulting in a much lower uh, fan, fan horsepower than other um, belt dryers out there. We then um, very simply made that up. It, um, we use low temperature operation that to, uh, dryers typically operate at 80 degrees Celsius, and we use a closed loop um, heating system to power these heat exchangers right here. Um, it's essentially the radiator in your car. And by operating at the lower temperature, we can be very flexible in the heat source. If you have weight, waste heat available from a digester, we can use that. Um, if all you have is natural gas, we can certainly use that. But because of the low temperature operation, we can use either air source or water source heat pump systems as well. And as important as the, the heat choice is, it, it's all modular design so we can change it in the future. If you're looking to put a dryer in right now and just get going and you have natural gas available, fine, let's fire it with that for now. A year down the road, two years down the road, your plant buys into a solar array and you're Electrical costs drop to zero because we know that all happens as soon as you go to a solar array. Uh, we can go to heat pumps and, and drive electric heat pumps. Also by being the very low temperature, we, we virtually eliminate the, the risk of uh, fire and explosion and also greatly reduce um, odor and dust. And by operating at the 80 degrees Celsius, we can meet the class A biosolids regulation. So then we simply take that the belt system that I talked about. Um, we have the heat exchangers here, and on the outlet side, and I'll get into a little bit more here. We have the um, 
odor scrubbing, heat recovery, and dehumidification section of the dryer. And we simply put all that inside essentially a refrigerator box. I guess in this case, it would be a heat box, but it, an insulated room. So this is looking at the inlet air side of, of the, the space. These are the heat exchangers bringing the hot air in. These are just some plates that are strategically put in place to direct the air exactly where we want it across the belt. This is the outlet side of the of the, the belt. So the air comes out here and continues on into whatever equipment we're providing, whether it be um, odor control scrubbers um, and then definitely heat recapture systems. So very, very open design, all the components um, are easy to get at, easy to clean, and probably most important, easy to service. So a couple of their components that we had, um, we, a series of agitators on the top belt to loosen and break up the sludge so that we get more surface area and open area so that the hot air can get in contact and start to dry it more quickly. Um, well, for a number of dosing systems, and a lot of it depends on the, the um, size of the dryer that we're using, which I guess I should have mentioned, we're kind of in the range of low end of about a, a thousand wet pounds per day of cake. So a thousand pounds per day of say 22% cake up to about 20,000 is the range that we, we make the most sense in. So Anyway, this is the uh, pasta, pasta dosing system, we call it. So it's essentially a pasta extruder that moves back and forth to put, lay this, the cake down on the belt. Um, very easy to um, access and maintain and unclog. There's cutting, um, cutting um, knives, I guess it'd be in here that can, if they do clog, this pops open and can be cleaned out quickly. Here's the, the matrix of the um, heat recovery system, and here it's shown up on top. So this is where we bleed, again, a little bit application dependent. We will bleed off somewhere around 10% of the total amount of air that we intake into the system. And we do a very good job of dehumidifying and recapturing the heat from that air before we discharge it. Uh, Dorset also offers a number of um, odor control system components and combinations thereof. We, they have a biological system, they have a standalone chemical system, and they also offer a, a hybrid uh, biological chemical system. They can all be adjusted to um, size constraints. Obviously, this one is a very, very large system. Just some more examples of the, the um, biological and um, odor control systems outside the dryer, which is right back here. An example of the heat recovery up on top of a platform over top of a dryer. And just to give you a, a size idea, this dryer back in here is capable of about 250 pounds an hour of 25% cake. And so we, we have, um, we have, so all coming from PW Tech and Dorset, we have the, the Volute Press, um, Dorset offers a number of cake feeding options. We can do um, cake feed pumps. We have bunkers and storage systems, and we we can do um, cake pump systems or um, conveyor systems as well. And as I mentioned, a number of biological and chemical um, based um, odor control systems. And that is my presentation. I love it. Short but sweet. Um, I have a quick question, but let me just 
let everyone know you have the Q&A. You can type questions in there for us, something in the chat. There's a raise hand option at the bottom. Um, if you raise your hand, I'm totally fine with unmuting you to ask your question directly. Um, but can, Chris, could you give us a, that looked like a pretty big unit, the 250 pound per hour thing. Like what's the space requirements for maybe the the lower end of your So the, the dryer? The lower... It's really the dryer that that's taken up that space. Yeah, well, actually, the, the heat recovery actually takes up a fair amount of space, but the heat recovery can be put up on a rooftop. It can yeah, be that's put cool. outside the space. The actual dryer is kind of this area back in here. So you can see it, it's about one uh, you know, one truck bay worth for, for a small plant. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to kind of get that perspective. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, yeah, and I was interested to see that you can use heat pumps for, for power. That is, I heard a lot about heat pumps at the New Year annual conference, and that's like the new thing. Yeah, heat pumps. National grid. Yep. And then um, take it one step further, we can look at water source heat pumps and actually use plant influent so that you're pulling the heat from 60 degree plant influent during the winter rather than trying to pull it from zero degree ambient air. So the efficiency of the heat pumps goes up tremendously. Great. Laura has her hand raised. I, I'm i going to ask you to unmute. You can go ahead and just ask Chris since we have time. Go ahead, Laura. Are you on mute? What if I just promote you to a panelist? You can ask me. I have a couple other questions coming in while we're waiting. Let me know when you're ready, Laura. Here's a question from, I believe, New Hampshire. Can the dryer be retrofitted to dewatering presses that are already in use? At, at, absolutely, um, depending on what the equipment is and if the operational hours required, we can go with larger or smaller um, uh, bunkers between the um, the existing dewatering equipment and the press. Um, if the, the controls get, I shouldn't say tricky, but a little challenging just to get the dewatering equipment and the um, drying technology to talk to each other, but it's, it can all be done, yes. All right. Chris, do you know what the approximate BTUs per pound of wastewater evaporated? Ooh, this is a really good question. Easy that is question. a real good question. <laughs> um, I, if you don't know for sure, I, I I'm going to be following up with your slide deck. Yes, and stuff let me. Can um, rather get them the real answer. Yeah, we actually just did this as part of a, a submittal package. For one. Okay. Um, yeah, I apologize. That would have been a really good number to have as part of the presentation. I, That's all right. Um, I know. You know who I asked know. it. We can let everybody know, and I will find out and get that information. Yep, I can print a uh, report of the questions and we'll make sure we answered them all. All right, yep. Laura, can you speak now? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Thank you. Oh, very good. wonderful. All right. Okay, I think somebody asked the question I was looking for, BTU per, uh, per pound of water. Um, I was going to ask it in a different way, like, you know, heat requirement per pound. Um, so I think I'm good. Okay, yep. so we'll follow up with the answer to that. All right, Chris, you ready? Here come some more questions. I'm what's right. the percent? What's the percent solids of the dry solids ultimately? Uh, typically, we shoot for ninety percent because that's what gets us the class A biosolids. Um, it it would be well, I shouldn't I shouldn't say hard. We can get a little bit above ninety, but then we have to look at a little bit higher operational temperatures. But then get us more energy usage, more energy yeah, I use, gotcha. explosion risks, dust risks. That um, conversely, if you don't need the class A biosolids, we can certainly go a bit lower. Okay, and that leads right into the next question: Do you still need fire suppression, explosion proof uh, lighting, and stuff in that area? I I say cautiously no. We've had a couple states in the Midwest that 
there seem to be seems to be some state requirements that we may have to put a fire suppression system in, but um, most of what we've seen so far, no, we don't need any. Okay. Um, here's another question. Love them. Love all these questions. What kind of power requirements are needed for the volute and kilowatt usage? Any? The the volute press is the very very. So our our largest volute press is good for about 200 gallons a minute of 1% sludge and total horsepower, not including feed pumps or conveyors, but total horsepower for the press is about six horsepower. Six horsepower. All right, thank you. Yeah. Could you restate what the material of the belt is again? It's, it's actually perforated pl plates and we do them optionally either out of stainless steel or powder-coated um, carbon steel. Right. Uh, what kind of time should be estimated for maintenance on the system when it's in operation? What kind of uh, downtime are we talking about? Yeah, about a man week per year. They, they, we, the belts are designed, the whole systems are designed to operate somewhere around 5,000 hours per year, which allows enough additional time for maintenance. It's, the routine maintenance is just some lubrication um, of, of grease fittings and things like that. So not a lot of intermediary maintenance. It, about once a year, it's you know, a little more involved. It's a little better cleaning. It's a little bit of tightening of the chain drive systems and things like that. All right. Thank you. Is there, does, are d design drawings needed from an engineer or can you perform work as a design build option? We can definitely do a design build option. You got some oh, engineers. Hopefully there's no the engineers team. on the line. None of our friendly engineers on the line heard that one, though, right? <laughs> well, you got your own <laughs> engineers, right? Um, this, I believe you already answered this, but can you go over again? Do you have any dryers installed in the USA, and does the material stand up over a long time period? Okay. So we, we do not have any dryers on municipal biosolids in the USA yet. We, we have a municipal dryer out in Vancouver, British Columbia, and quite a number of them throughout Europe. If anybody's going to IFAT this year and want to take a quick side trip to go see a few, there's a number right in the Munich area. Um, the We have quite a number, not quite, there's about, don't hold me, about 13 Dorset dryers installed throughout the U.S. on a number of different applications. Like and the, the answer is yes. The, the, so we have one customer who's installing their third door set dryer right now, and they're installing their third because they've had another one running for over 10 years now. It has held up fine on a, a chicken manure application. Okay. Yeah, that's some pretty rough stuff too. All right, thanks, Chris, for that answer. Um, do you recommend 24-7 operation? You will definitely get better efficiency at 24 seven operation. It, it well, I should say at 24 hour a continuous operation. It doesn't have to be seven days a week. Most of our systems are designed for, are, are sized for 24 hours a day, about five days per week. Um, we okay. do have some, we actually don't, but there are some customers in Europe that run them less often. They run them in that eight to 10 hour a day just a couple days, and you do lose just a little bit of efficiency from that half hour to 45 minutes of startup time plus the lost heat when you shut it down and let it go back to ambient temperature. Okay. Well, I think we got through all the questions that we had. That was quite the fire Q&A. And, &A. and uh, I don't know, anyone else have any questions? You can raise your hand at this point. Oh, yep, we got one more here. Uh, how do you demonstrate the material meets class A? Time and temperature make sense, but it needs to be demonstrable, either yeah, via controls yeah. or instrumentation. Yeah. Demonstrable. Yeah, yeah yes. So, so I'm happy to get into details with it there um, and actually bring the controls guys in. But there's quite a number of temperature sensors that are watching the inlet air and the outlet air in um, quite a number of locations and space is known. So we know the time that that is in temperature. 
And then as part of the um, proven process, we actually embed temperature, little there are these little temperature sensors that are actually um, manually embedded in the sludge. And then the and we can watch the location and the temperature and time plot of each of those sensors as it are runs. Are those like little and, disposable things or what? They're I mean, they're a little too expensive to dispose of, but yeah, they're they're basically little, you know, kind of the the temperature version of your um the eye tag that you have in your luggage to find out where it is. Yeah. It's just it's a tough environment. Yeah. All right, we got another question here. This is great. We have plenty of time for questions. Does the dryer work under a slight negative pressure, Chris? It is under a slight negative pressure, yes, to keep the um, odors inside of it. Yeah, that would also help with air emissions. Yep. All right. Any other questions for Chris? I'm going to stop sharing your screen and uh, so we can see you yep we got another question now the what's the i knew we had to get one of these what's the average cost of the what's the cost of an average dryer i know you can't really it, say but yeah yeah say maybe on so the low end yep yeah. um i guess realistically at the low end you're just shy of a million dollars yeah we know these are expensive thank you for being honest yep yeah. Yep. A lot of grant, a lot of grant money available for it. Though. Yeah, and lots to talk about. Yeah, and we, we centralized actually, or regionalized maybe yeah, facility. Yeah, yeah, and we have also been working with a, a um, he's really a grant, a grant source locator that is pretty keyed into Department of Energy grants. Yes, but they have a lot of funding going towards decarbonizing yeah. wastewater yeah. in particular. Yeah. So that's yeah. a good, that's smart. Another question, Chris. Is the process gas recirculated and how is condensate collected and managed? So, yes, yeah, so the, the air is, is about, well, it depends on the application, somewhere about 90% of the air is, is recycled. So 10% is exhausted. It does go through a, um, a scrubbing system and a dehumidification system. And then there's also an, an you know a energy recapture system to pull the the as much heat as we can back out of that that air before it's discharged. So so that I guess the the part you had the question about it's really a dehumidification system that pulls the the moisture out. And just a follow up to that, you just mentioning about the DOE grants. Are they grants or tax incentives? Do you happen to know, Chris? Uh... There there's some of both. Um, I'm happy to put whoever's asking the question in touch with with Rob. Um, you know, we have somebody really good at that, so I I just I really don't even. Yes, and we did have a process. we did have a webinar with Rob about all the different sources of funding that are coming out right now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's put that that we'll put that answer back in the when we respond with the questions. All right, I think we got another question. Another technical question: Is the condensate captured via plates or packed bed? column that is a good question i Ooh. yeah i i i will have to check with the engineering on that one all right like i said i will print the report and we'll make sure we answer all the questions that you had anyone else I have questions for Chris. I think maybe we're just all newy it out. <laughs> but that was real no, that was really interesting. And um thanks again. Thanks, Chris and PW Tech. And Absolutely. thanks. Thank you for having thanks us. to all of you for joining us today. Um if you happen to be not a Nebra member and you got a, a free pass to this webinar today, please consider joining us. We have a lot of good member services and information for you out there. I cannot believe we made it through one presentation without saying the PFAS word, Chris. So I thank you for that. You just did. <laughs> but I, I thank you for that. And, and, uh, and yes, as um, a membership co-chair on the, the board of directors of Nebra, folks that are guests, 
come come join us, come support the the amazing work that Janine and crew are doing for the, the biosolids and residuals folks in New England and beyond. Well, thanks for that plug, Chris. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Next month, we will have National Grid. They'll be presenting on all their various programs that wastewater utilities can take advantage of to save energy and money. And more importantly, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So if there is something you would like to lunch and learn about in the future, please let me know. I'm always looking for new ideas. So send me an email. And thanks again for attending today. Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Take care.